Okay, hello everyone, and welcome to the Mandalorian review, sort of, that I'm doing. Uh, this is a Mandalorian drawing, but I figured I'd just throw this in as a little special treat for you assholes. And with me today is two other assholes, uh, Paige and Pat, right? Yes. Say hello, assholes. Hello. Hello, hello. assholes. All right. So, uh, I'm doing this specifically because I watched the series beforehand, and then I w went back and rewatched the entire thing with these two assholes. And so, as a result, I figured, you know, let's uh, let's talk about it. Let's be assholes together. Yes. So, to that the end... Poop flaps. Yes, the, the, I don't see what that has to do with anything, but all right. Uh, so, to that end, here, enjoy this drawing. We probably won't be commenting on it too much. I'll just go ahead and say... Uh, I had a general idea. It worked out okay, but don't worry about it too much. There's no it's baby just, in the picture. It's, it's a good just drawing. a blank rectangle. You don't even know what it's going to look like yet. All right. Anyways. Oh. Okay. So. Oh, I, oh, uh, you're going to draw it? Oh, yeah. I'm drawing it right now. I'm just very fast, Pat. <laughs> okay, because it looks it looks like a blank rectangle. Well, that's because your contrast is probably fucked up. I'm drawing a primary right now, so it's probably oh. so light that on your TV you probably can't see it. Oh, it's because it's on my shit monitor. Hold on, let yes. me move it to my good one so I can see the good. Okay. Well, anyways, uh, The Mandalorian TV Show. Uh, this will, of course, include spoilers, so if you have not seen the show, go see the show. It's a good show, right, you two? Good show? It was great! My I... review is that it was good. I have not liked anything Star Wars in so long, and when we saw the first episode together, I like, I had tears in my eyes, and I was like, "Oh, it's Star oh, Wars yeah. again!" You know, I was we had so to excited. wrench your arm. Like, I, I think I had to like threaten you with violence. Yeah, I wasn't you allowed know, to watch it for more than a year because <laughs> Paige wanted to watch it with me, this but is... she never wanted to watch it. This is entirely my fault. It's my doing. I wanted to watch it with Pat, and I was like, Bleh. you have to wait for me. And and so I made him wait. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. but, but, but And then I was like, we should watch Mandalorian. And Paige was like, I don't know. I don't feel like Star Wars. And then one day he's like, we're watching it. And you're going to deal yeah, with it. Yeah, he forced me. But I, I'm the, so glad you forced me. It was, it was so much fun. Like, just the, a blast. The, the tipping point was Eli was like, I want to watch it. And I'm like, I want to watch it. And you're like, I don't know. And I'm like, okay, this is stupid, Paige. I'm just going to watch it. <laughs> and I you can watch it with off. me or not. I get scared in like a really weird way I can't describe. I just get nervous. When this woman frightened of enjoyment. watched all of like Will and Grace and then like sat on the final <laughs> episode for like three months. Yeah, I, we couldn't wait. Did we ever finish it? Yes. I don't did, I I don't think I don't think I did. I think you did. We both because, did, Paige. No, I don't think so because in they my met at the college thing, with their kids. Pat, you're spoiling it. You can't spoil the end of Will and Grace. But you <laughs> and I don't care. Because this is a video about the Mandalorian, not That's Will and true. Grace's theoretical children or whatever the hell's going on. <laughs> Okay, That's so true. even from the first episode of Mandalorian, it pretty much hooks you in. <laughs> yes. uh, I have a very poor memory, so even though I've seen the whole thing twice, I have a memory that if you like start recounting things, I will immediately start remembering them. But mm -hmm. otherwise, I'm just like, what? What's? I don't. I have no idea what you're talking about. But the first couple of episodes do involve him actually meeting the baby, the child, the fifty-year-old child. And uh, setting things off um, <laughs> from that point. Uh, his actual character arc, I guess, is that he is a foundling, which means that he is essentially an orphan that Mandalorians, or a sect of Mandalorians, uh, come across. Uh, his parents were, in theory, murdered. Although I don't think that was ever shown on screen, so they might bring that up later on if they want to do. They that. like run Ooh, away, and then like a like a like a board falls over a hole, and then there's a big explosion, and you hear, "Ah, we're dead! We're the parents, and we're dead!" But you don't see it. Surely, yeah, yeah. So th that's essentially what happened. Uh, so the entire premise of him, and this is is sort of filling in plot holes with the actual continuity of Star Wars. Because uh, they have this idea of they never take off their helmets, and it's their armor is very important to them. It's a very family heirloom, and but that sort of contradicts a lot of things that you saw in the original movies, and also in a lot of the books, and so forth and so on. So their solution to that was basically, okay, they used to be really, really crazy, 
now for the most part, they don't really care too much. So the entire society of the Mandalorians has sort of shifted over time. And now some of them believe that and some of them don't. And with uh, Din Djarin, I think is his name, uh, played by Pedro Pascal? Yes. Yeah. Um, he is a foundling, so he's an orphan that was raised by the crazy uh, culty uh, side of things. Uh, so he firmly believes in this idea, until he doesn't, that he should never remove his helmet in front of others, and that um, this is the way, and, you know, this... His entire life is consumed with uh, uh, him being focused on the way of the Mandalorians, the, right. man, uh, the Mandalore. He's he's basically uh, Worf, right? Sort of, in a way, yeah. He yeah, gets I'd Worf a few Worf. times, too. Yeah. <clears throat> so let's see if I can remember everything here. Uh, well, I uh, know... Something I did... Oh. Well, go ahead. Sorry, uh, something I did want to mention is that mm-hmm. this series is rife with uh, guest stars. Yeah, Wer- uh, Herzog think in, is there, for fuck's sake. Yeah, I think, uh, let's see, Horatio Sands played the uh, the first guy in the first episode, the uh, blue fish man. I forget what their species is called, but he's the guy that he tracks yeah. down his first bounty. Uh, yeah, the creepy fish man. Of course, uh, Carl Weathers, of course, is there playing um, the bounty hunter giver, <laughs> whatever his role is. Uh, Grief, I think his name is. Uh, Warner Herzog, of course. Um, there's a guy that you know, I think, Paige. Uh, Brian... Brian Posen? Oh, Posen. Brian Posen! Posen. Like, yes! Posen? Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, he was uh, He was just briefly there as a speeder pilot, and I think yeah. in the first episode or the second episode. Yeah, first cameo. episode. It's fantastic. And he dies horribly, doesn't he? Yes. Yes. Immediately. So, and it's wonderful. That's a weird little fun thing about the Mandalorian, is that just people, you know, kind of just show up very briefly, and they have their little cameo, and then usually they're done. Either they will yeah. die horribly, or they'll just kind of vanish off screen. And sometimes they're even on screen only for a few seconds. Like, Bill Burr is there, playing the same character yeah. Bill Burr plays literally every time. That he's ever in anything because he is Bill Murr. Yeah. Like when he showed up, I thought, oh, he's going to die. Or it, it's kind of like how in SVU, when you see a really famous person, they're either the villain or they're going to die. Right? But no. Somehow. And Nick Nolte plays, uh, what's his name? Uh, I forget how you pronounce his name, but he's the little uh, I have spoken guy. Oh. Uh, Kuil or. I can't remember. I the love old him. man remember that we it. really liked for the first couple of episodes yes. that he was in. Yeah, yeah. Star Wars has that problem, Lord. I like that guy. What was his name? I don't know. I have no <laughs> right? idea. No it was idea. Jin Jin Tabaru or whatever the fuck the Star Wars oh, name they it. got. Yeah, he was cool. I liked um, him. But the person that did the like physical capture. For that character, I think mm-hmm. went on to play another character of importance later on in season two, but I can't remember who. Mm. Uh, let's see. There's a lot of this kind of one of the strain points for Mandalorian. There are so many like disposable characters like, oh, yeah, that one. And then that one. Uh, that's one of the strengths of Star Wars is that there's a lot of disposable product placement, I guess. Yeah. Um, like the IG unit. That everyone fell in love with? IG-11? The assassin droid? IG-88, yeah, IG-11. Man. Well, I no, the... No, uh, IG-11's the one in I'm Mandalorian. Sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I keep doing that. It was assumed that it was IG-88, but uh, they decided, no, 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 it's just a fairly identical model to that. And I think more than one may have showed up at some point. I don't quite remember. But the one that is most associated with the story is played by... Uh, Taika Waititi Mm -hmm. and um, that thing was fucking awesome there's like there's not much to say it does sort of have a character arc and that it becomes a nursing robot at some point and then it's it kind of needlessly sacrifices itself in my opinion like there's not really reason for it to blow itself up I completely needed to have a a dramatic payoff for that part of the episode (laughs) 
Well, I, I think which also th- there's there's that element where, which I thought it was really beautiful, where um, Mando is, forgive me, but this is towards the end of season one. I think mm-hmm. it's the last episode. I think it's Redemption. Yeah, we're skipping around, everyone. Uh, chapter, sorry, chapter eight, Redemption, where um, IG-11 uh, sees that Mando is dying and needs medical attention immediately. And so um, he has everyone leave, but Mando's like, no, I'm not taking off my helmet. And the robot's like, take it off. And Mando refuses. I can't uh, pull off my helmet in front of any living creature. And it, I just thought it was so genius. IG-11 says, but I am no living creature. And it's like, oh, of course. So of course he takes off his helmet. I thought that was yeah, so smart. It's it's like Star Wars has done this a bunch with a bunch of different stories. And it's like, are droids real people? Because everyone treats them like they're not real people, but Until they're they clearly do. more than, like, nothing. Yeah. And some characters, like, I think Obi-Wan has consistently always treated all of his droids with, like, oh, they're just devices, who cares? Whereas, um, like, Anakin, uh, he was really attached to all of his droids, and he would, like, risk missions sometimes to rescue them. And uh, so the values of characters concerning whether they consider them to be actual people uh, kind of shifts dramatically on who it is. Yeah. Um, which was part of um, uh, Jin's uh, character arc, the Mandalorian, whatever. I think his name is <laughs> Din, isn't it? Is it Din? Oh, crap. I always just think of him as Mando. His name is terrible, kind of. Yeah, it's Din. All, his first all name's Star Din. Wars names are terrible. Yeah. Yeah, Din, the... Jar- Din Jarin. Yeah, Din Jarin. Uh, but anyways, Din. Uh, his entire thing is that he heavily distrusts uh, droids, uh, specifically in his case because of the Clone Wars. Mm-hmm. Uh, whenever the Separatists were stomping about killing people, of course, his family was attacked by a bunch of... Um, I forget what they are, B-88s? or No, no, no. I forget what their actual number is, but it's the big stompy ones that have rocket launchers for arms. The cool ones, not right. the, the the not the cute ones. <laughs> so uh, as a result, he just no no he he just he doesn't trust droids at all. Like he kind of hates them. Uh, he can he can sort of use them. Like it's not crippling or anything, but he really doesn't want them around. Especially not the assassin droid that was made specifically to kill people. Right. Um, and of course, by the end of season one, he comes around. It's like, well, not all droids. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I, I think it's really beautiful that a droid both saves his life and the entire <laughs> party's by sacrificing it itself. I think I think that's really very. It, I just thought it was really well done. More than yeah, that, that it's like droid had a lot of badass moments too. For, yeah. for me, like the the droid blowing itself up at the end is a great example of what I thought the show's best, like, strength was. Like, I mean, the directing's great and the acting's great, but there's so often that you're watching something and little threads just don't go anywhere ever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And every single time some, like, rudimentary or externalized detail came up, it would eventually pay off. So, like, in the second episode, or, like, third episode, the droid keeps trying to blow himself up incessantly, and it's played like a oh, comedy yeah. bit. Yeah. So that you you and you remember that scene, so that you get to the, 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 the finale of the final episode of the first season, and he starts talking, and, and you remember, you go, oh, no, he's going to blow himself up, because he needs to, oh, no... And they did that with all sorts of shit, with the condition of the ship, with the guns that he happens to be carrying, the locations of people, who has what job, all sorts of shit. It was great. Uh, The the dog. The baby (laughs) (laughs) being obsessed with that little ball came up like ten times. There were no red herrings. Not one red herring. It was beautiful. Yeah, uh, whenever screenwriters are creating what they create um there's a lot of concern about uh, a tight script that is a script where every single element is working towards something in some way and every element is used it's sort of like a whatever you <laughs> whenever you kill an animal uh it's like you need to use every part of the animal you know this uh old way of thinking about hunting 
Uh, same way applies whenever you're doing writing. It's like whenever you're hunting the animal, whenever you're writing the script, you need to try to use every single element of it. And if you're not using every element of it, then why did you incorporate it in the first place? Why are you wasting it? Um, there are a few movies that are described as having incredibly tight scripts where every single element is working, regardless of whatever you think about them, like Godfather or whatever. Um, it, it's very hard to do. Uh, so whenever they actually are pulling that off and they're using every single element that they're introducing, that is definitely something to applaud. Mm-hmm. So yeah. with the overall arc of the characters, and, and the first season, that is generally what his arc was, I guess, was him confronting what his past was. Uh, the, it's less of a character arc, it's more of just revealing what his backstory was, because the, the actual series really takes its time with every single element of its storytelling. There are some episodes where there's not even any dialogue at all until like halfway through the entire episode. But it's so great. Yeah. just communicate everything perfectly. It's great. So, um, yeah, most of season one is just introducing information, I think. Whereas season two is more about character arcs. But there is there are a few character arcs in uh, season one. Um, with Din, of course, his whole robot fiasco revealing information about uh, the orphanage. Uh, actually embracing the... Uh, Mandalorian way, even though he's apparently very new to it. Because at the very mm -hmm. start, he doesn't even have his armor. Uh, he's still sort of gathering the bits Material. to actually uh, create it. Yeah, he's a little yeah. baby. And, and the spares he gives over to the foundlings, although I guess that does sort of pay off, I think, later. I can't remember what happens with all the, the foundling material, because I think he, he comes back later after the attack, uh, after all of them get wiped out. And he does recover most of that material in the form of his uh, uh, armor. I can't quite remember what happened with it. I don't. I don't remember. I don't. I don't think anything happened with uh, the the foundling uh, scraps. I don't think, but I don't recall. Well, I know that uh, she survives uh, the armor. Yeah. She doesn't actually have a name. Emily Swallow. Uh, that she plays uh, the armor. Uh, she's the one that handles all the best car and handing all that out. And the final thing that she's doing after the attack is she's the only survivor, so she stays there and is collecting the remnants of all the uh, uh, best car armor from all the fallen mm -hmm. uh, warriors. And uh, she, I think, she does manage to survive, or at least it's left uh, sort of hanging. So you oh, don't quite. I was know under what the assumption she made it out. They they painted that character as borderline invincible. Like the, yeah, the mm -hmm. ultimate. Yeah, she's fine. <laughs> It's yeah, go a back shame to... that I have spoken guy was not invincible. I to, to, I adored him. To Such go back shame. to what you were talking about before, Eli, about like with the mm -hmm. what the first season seemed to be about. Like it did seem to be backstory related, but I I would personally like contextualize it more as like the it's it's about dealing with Jin's what what's this Din, Din fuck it. Mando Din yeah his <laughs> his fatal flaw. Which is like his absurd, uncompromising rigidity. Like, mm -hmm. you get into a situation in which he is literally, I will kill myself rather than budge even the, the smallest mm. inch on this, this creed. Which he yeah. eventually capitulates on just like a baby, really? tiny baby step. Which sets up the, the context for his arc in the second season. Mm -hmm. That's all of what second season is. Of course, season one, like, we haven't even really mentioned uh, Grogu, since he's sort of more a plot device as opposed yeah. to, I like, think he's there. I think it's pretty funny that, so, like, we, uh, me and Paige got to this, like, ages, ages after it was, like, brand new and relevant. And I remember seeing um, Disney and LucasArts just, like, fight just like it's not he's not baby yoda it's it's stop calling him baby yoda it's the child it's the it's the child stop calling him baby yoda and then eventually like his name comes okay, out as grogu and it's like I, my brain literally just calls him baby yoda still yeah mm -hmm. like there's no fixing that it's too late yeah, they, they shouldn't have waited <laughs> too long <of> that <laughs> they should have um, waited what two and a half years or whatever it was to Give the fucking it was kid like a, a year and a half, yeah. 
they did make a statement after they released his name. It's like, okay, if you want to call him Baby Yoda, just go. We're, we're done caring. Just go I'll ahead. I'll do what I want, Disney. <laughs> it doesn't help that there's, like, no information on Yoda's race at all. No, um, nothing. Yeah, even in time, the EU stuff, it's, there's fucking nothing. Well, wasn't yeah. there wasn't there something long, about how there can only be like a certain number of them at a time? Oh, sorry. Um, for the longest time, that was something that I think even Lucas said this this idea that there should only be one at a time, but that went out the window with the uh, prequels because then Yaddle shows up and she's just sort of on the council as as well until she mysteriously vanishes by the third movie. I think she kind of just leaves and uh what happened to her if anyone cares is i th think it was anakin whatever he was doing his uh, padawan shit um there was some sort of attack on at at coruscant i think or they were on a mission and she had to like intercept a missile and that's what killed her yeah um, did it to 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 save everyone on the surface. It was some weird she situation. She did a, she died. She pulled a second to Sanchiro. <clears throat> but that's what happened there. So, uh, hmm. Yoda's race, whatever they're called, uh, the baby George Yoda. famously despises the idea of giving any information about them at all. So whenever they actually do need information, uh, they don't know what to do. Like the whole red letter media bit. Like, what color is Yoda's blood? George, oh, green? Like, he, he doesn't know. He doesn't care. Uh, so if you're looking for any information on them, you will not find it. Um, so that's one of the... I guess that was one of the main draw points of the series in the first place was just the idea that they might expand into some sort of pertinent information rather than just cock teasing. Right. Which they really haven't done too much, but I don't think anyone really cares. But Grogu, yeah, Grogu is just sort of the animal that eats everything. He's 50 years old, and he will eat anything he can get his little mitts on. I wish that were me. The weird thing about that is that in Season 2 you learned that he was trained at the Jedi Temple... Yeah. And he had masters. So why does he act like like a one year old dog? Because like, he's he's sixty, but he's the they lived like eight million, so it's like he's like two. Yeah, so he sort of knows what he's doing, but he doesn't care. Maybe I mean, he just doesn't have a system of ethics. He's a little kid. You know, fuck it. He's a it's baby like, with superpowers. Well, it's, I mean, it's that like, is the. Oh, go ahead. That is the the thread line for that character. I guess is that mm. you don't really know if he's going to be good or evil. Supposedly, Yoda's race has a very strong inclination towards the light side of the Force for some reason, according to uh, George. Um, but Grogu does uh, force choke a bitch a couple of times, and he yeah. like nearly destroys like that lizard lady's lineage almost yeah he oh, doesn't yeah. use the force to do that he just eats the baby yeah he's just eating eating baby oh uh, that's the one um the same person that did the i have spoken guy also oh. did the physical actions for the frog lady that's what it was oh that was a good one i think that's the passenger i think that's that episode that was that was a really good one the the, the whole light side like dark side power set shit is it's awful. It's mm -hmm. it's the worst. And it's extra the worst because it was unclear right away. Because Luke force chokes guys in Return of the Jedi. Oh, yeah. Like, that's just... He, he force chokes those pig dudes. Yeah, it's ill-defined. It's like, I, it guess, really, I like, guess Luke was being bad that day. It, it's a very frustrating thing with... The fandom, especially, because everyone has this idea of what exactly the Force is and what light side and dark side actually means and why it's okay to do this thing one time, but it's not okay to do this other thing. And that's been incorporated into the the, the setting multiple times. Like, there's a character 
in the prequels, I can't remember which one it is, that can use force lightning, but it's good force lightning. Not like Yoda, it's hmm. another character, I can't remember. Shut up. But Shut up. <laughs> but it's it's good force lightning because there's no like hatred in his heart. And it's like shut up. What the fuck are you talking about? But whatever. Like the my cornet kind of perspective of the force has always just been it's just a power that you have and if you're bad then you tend to do bad things. Like the Emperor used lightning because he wanted to torture Luke. Yeah, because lightning it. hurts like shit. Yeah, it's not because he, you know, hit a certain threshold in his video game power set and that unlocked the ability to use Force Lightning. Right. Like, that seems incredibly stupid to me, but that's what we got. But anyways, yeah. Uh, the, the Force actually almost never comes up in The Mandalorian. It sort of does in Season 2, but it's not really... Like, it's important, but it's not really addressed in that way. Only it's once kind Ahsoka of... shows up, isn't it? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. And she does, uh, and like, use it. Like, a couple uh, people say, may the force be with you, but, like, the response to that is, like, yeah, whatever. Yeah, like, okay. Crazy yeah. person. Like, um, it's, it's, it's one of the best things about Mandalorian is that the force is there so little because it gets to dodge all the stupid, stupid mm -hmm. nonsense we were just talking about. But it also causes the, like, my biggest problem with... Star Wars as a setting in total, and I remember me and, uh, we, me and you and, and Paige were all talking about this. It's like, Jedi were like everywhere in like a galactic world war mm -hmm. like 20 years ago. Like, how the fuck did that go from like FBI agents are everywhere to... What's a what's a what's the force? Is this that... is something that the Star oh. Wars setting has always been really, really bad at communicating. It's because the setting wants to say something, like it wants one thing to be true, but it also wants another thing. Um, so it wants the idea that n almost no one knows what's going on in the greater scope of the galaxy because there's lots of planets that are just isolated and they don't even really know anything about the universe at large. And there's uh, lots of pockets of civilization that just communicate with each other, like one or two planets, and then that's it. So they don't even know that Coruscant might exist. They might not know that the Jedi exist, you know, at all. Like, they've never heard of it at all. Uh, and that's the way the setting, in theory, should work. But whenever they're actually telling the stories, all the stories are so fo focused on Jedi and Sith and so on that they need characters to com uh, communicate that. So whenever you get to, like, the prequels and you have little baby Anakin who is a slave on a planet, uh, Tatooine, and has should, in theory, have never have heard of this before in his entire life. Like, ah, oh, yeah, Jedi, you have laser swords. You shouldn't know that. Like, like he's, a, he's an uneducated slave on the most backwater shithole planet in the fiction. Like, I mean, we all know Tatooine because mm -hmm. it's been mm -hmm. it's dramatically stuff. overrepresented. But the reason why Tatooine shows up in the story in the first place, it's supposed to be the ass end of nowhere. Mm -hmm. But the That's why, why that Obi-Wan hides him there! The, the reason why that happens is because they want that tight script. They want all the, com the information that the viewer needs to be communicated very rapidly and just to get it out of the way. So as a result, usually characters will recognize who a Jedi is and explain it or the Jedi will explain themselves and just to get it out of the way as quickly as possible. So the characters in the setting are always way more informed than they ha ever have a right to be. And Mandalorian actually kind of fixes that problem by treating the setting as it should be treated, which almost never happens otherwise. Yeah, I'm thinking about Ahsoka, uh, Tano, and how dude shows up to see her. like, are you a Jedi? She's like, nah. And doesn't he refer to them as never, like witches? It's, it's never gone yeah. into at all. Like they don't, they don't talk about. Well, you see, back in Rebels, I was uh, fell into a time portal or whatever. Like, no, it doesn't matter. Oh, you know about that, huh? She does the magic, and she, she knows about the baby. Yeah, that's uh, so for the. I'll briefly the mention current, that for yeah, the current the plot. 
Oh man, yeah. Star Wars has time travel. She really? Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Uh, oh. The current working theory is that, of course, the Disney uh, sequels were uh, not warmly received. So as a result, there is a theory. This is not confirmed. It might just be wild fan speculation that uh, Filoni is sort of fixing that by looking at something that happened in Star Wars Rebels, where Ahsoka found a time portal in a, I think it was a Sith temple, and used that, and she briefly fought Darth Vader, because of course, uh, but that supposedly may have created some sort of schism in the time stream, so not, there's like a, a Star Trek-esque problem. Yeah, I actually there are multiple settings. I, I watched the, the the bit that that was from, where it was a thing in in Rebels where Ahsoka fights Darth Vader and they leave her, and it's assumed that she died. Uh, and then the main character finds a portal through time and sees her about to get killed by Darth Vader and just reaches through and yanks her out. Mm -hmm. Oh. And then so it goes, oh, she's alive! And then they destroyed the temple, so there would be no more time travel afterwards. And it's like, I, I don't think you can unring that bell, guys. No. I think, I think you've kind of fucky-wuckied it pretty bad now. There, there are a few details in The Mandalorian where things are, like, not as they should be in relation to the Disney canon. I can't remember what they are. Like, I have not looked into it this much. Uh, but that's the idea, is that he's been living little hints that the timeline is not what it should be. And so some people have assumed as a result that, oh, this is a different timeline, and this is how we're going to fix the Disney canon, by basically just saying it never happened in this timeline. I gotta say, it like, this Ouch. discussion sucks, because... <laughs> <laughs> St Star Wars is uh, fucking stupid and has no depth. It is yeah. it's pulp. Like individual those original characters movies can have depth. But yeah, are are, are pulp sci-fi. It's about a hero and the rogue and the princess and it's and uh, oh the bounty hunter and it's like oh wow and we see Mando and it's like it's so eminently successful as a space western. That's about really simple things like, uh, you know, the bond with the child and oh no, the empire, right? And every time that it goes to expand into this, like, oh, the timeline, and like, oh, this character and the canon, it's always like, this is st like, it just it doesn't matter. Yeah. Like, just like, all I want is a bunch of stories <clears throat> that happen in this Star place. Wars is best used as a container for smaller stories about individual characters or in fact floofy yeah. meaningless stories like episode four which is called uh i think it's called sanctuary that's the one with the widow i think that is probably one of the most perfect episodes because it, it it's like pretty well contained right it's it's just it's just a story it, it could have i don't know what do you guys think it's a story that has nothing to do with star wars at all yes yes <laughs> yes but it's so cool I, I loved it. I it loved it. It looks like Western. Star Wars and it sounds like Star Wars, but it, it could be a regular Western. In fact, right. it really just is a regular Western. Yeah, because it has like the, the competent widow or whatever the trope is. Gunslinging I, widow. I do like sometimes whenever they do go into like the forest and shit, but it's like the two examples I really think of are the Darth Plagueis novel and the uh, Bane Trilogy novels. Um, and primarily the, the first one in the Bane Trilogy novel. That, that one's really good. Because those are primarily about the characters. And the, the Force does come up and they explain a lot of its elements and how it works and why it works the way that it does. But all that is still in service to explaining why the characters are behaving the way that they're behaving. Like the whole idea with Bane is that he was this ex-miner who was uh, basically used as a slave and he broke free of that and he saw that he saw that oh the dark side I'm skipping a lot but the, the dark side is a force that uh, basically tricks you into being obsessed with power just by the nature of how it works uh, and it, it explains how that goes down it actually does make sense um, but his entire character thing is that he actually embraces that and goes, you know what? I don't care. I want the power. 
So I will just willingly uh, let it essentially brainwash me into being who I am. And that's how he ends up becoming Darth Bane. So it, it does have like a character focus, but it's very rare for them to actually treat it that way. Bane's the guy who doesn't wear a shirt, right? He is the guy that has, in the first couple books anyways, has a weird scarab armor over his skin that won't come off without killing him. Oh. But otherwise he is like a bald human minor man. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there he is. That's the photo I recognize of him. Yeah. I thought he wasn't He's wearing right. a shirt, but it turns out he was all covered in bugs. The Darth Plagueis novels are uh, really good, too. It, it, he's Plagueis is not a nice person, but he is interesting because he's just a banker. Like, he's not a warrior or anything. He's like a manipulative, like, scheming banker that does, like... <laughs> he gets, like, actually fucked up by some assassins because he wasn't paying attention one time. And most of his study of the dark arts is, like, staying awake forever. <laughs> it's weird things like that. It, it's, yeah, it's, it's a fun it's, novel, especially when Palpatine's there. It's one of the things that Mando excels at that I don't think the movies did nearly as well, which is people end up being true to their characters and act in ways that, that makes sense for them. Is appropriate to their characters. Like Yoda and the Emperor having a lightsaber fight is the stupidest thing in the world. Yeah. Yoda was supposed to be this character that's like, why would you fight? I was like, wars do not make one great. Why would you like they've, try to solve things with violence? Transcended physical concerns. Mm. Yeah. So him like doing laser flips, <laughs> doing <laughs> sick beat downs with Palpy in the middle of the Senate. Like, okay. So and it also makes Palpatine look super fucking shit and weak because he was supposed to be a master manipulator, an evil force that couldn't be stopped. Oh my god, he's got lightning? That's crazy. Nobody else has... Oh, everyone has lightning. Everyone's got lightning. That, that's just like a thing you get to do. I mentioned it before, but uh, the novelization of the third movie is really good. Like, way better than any has any right to be because all the dumb shit that's actually in the movie is actually explained in a way by a writer that's tr desperately trying to fix all of it. And it is very, very character focused. And even stuff like how did no one know that this was going on actually does make sense in the novel, but definitely not in the movie. Mm. But yeah, I, I would say that star Wars is at its best whenever it's just focusing on characters uh, that definitely rings true for Mandalorian, even for the original films as floofy and sort of sugary as they can be. Um, most of the reason why people were on board with them is, of course, special effects and everything, but, like, just the, the characters even existing as tropes, like Han, like, people liked Han for being Han because his, the acting was good, like, yeah. he was fun to watch, like, all the characters were fun to watch, that's why people cared. You can have, um, you can have, uh, like, the sequel movies that are, you know, light years ahead of the visual effects of all the previous movies, but just... No one cares because there's nothing going on with these characters. Oh man, Finn! They should have done more with Finn. That was such a it, yeah. It I'm just glad a total ball drop. I'm glad he at least put his foot down. It's like, no, I'm done with Star Wars. Yeah, you know he had a lot of potential and they just wasted him. Yeah, Mandalorian, sure. like, unfortunately for like the Star Wars at whole like, ends up taking Finn's character and showing just how badly they botched it because Bill Burr's character mm. is Finn's character again. Yep. Done better and way faster. Like, yeah, the they... idea of the Empire, Imperial forces that quit, like, that's fascinating. Yeah, and he they was only did in... nothing with that. No. It, it, they, Bill Burr was only in two episodes and he just he was he was magnificent and I really I'm not gonna hold my breath but I, I do hope that he is somehow in season three I would love to see him again like that character was great he he's great I know he's just Bill Burr he's just being Bill Burr in Star Wars land but like I just loved him and I loved what they did I like the him, idea but just... unfortunately he died remember yeah, oh, yeah. He died. yeah sad, sad. <laughs> it, it, sad. It, it, wishful it, thinking I, I mean, this is a bit off topic, but, like, Bill Burr did a great job in his role. Yeah. Like, but is he... 
is he a good actor? Is that even acting? Like, what, I mean, like... he's he's a good actor in the way that George Clooney or like Julia Roberts are good actors. You understand? No. Like, like I think they're... of him in the same way that I think of Eminem is acting. Like, people are like, oh wow, Eminem, he's so good. He's playing himself. Like, he's well, just being saying. himself. That's what I'm like, saying. Like zero range. Like just. Yeah. But Absolutely. the one the one range they do have, you're like, oh yeah, that was good. I mean, they wrote it. I mean, they clearly wrote it I, I mean i imagine they probably wrote it for him and i just i, I felt way. i i think it was great i like that i think it's fun he was wonderful As he himself. did a fantastic job i think that the way that they incorporated like i think they brought him back in the second season just because people liked uh that episode so much yeah um but I was impressed that they managed to not only bring him back in a way that made sense for uh, his character, Mayfield, um, but also incorporated that with the overall plotline thread for the main character at the same time in a way that not only made sense, but was probably the most pivotal moment for that character in the entire series so far. Yep, absolutely. Oh yeah, the, the, that, the, he, the scene in the cafeteria is a total showstopper. Yeah, when he ta- when he is forced to come to term bill burr basically convinces him he's like you know you have you yeah, have to do this or all is lost so he takes well, that conversation helmet. on the way there um, yeah like what counts like what exactly what are the limits of this thing that you believe does it count if uh like can you just never take the helmet off at all like do you take it off whenever you sleep does it count if you're wearing a different helmet like you're doing that now <laughs> Like you're right. not wearing your armor in front of me. You're wearing a completely. You're wearing the armor of your most hated enemy at this point. Yeah. When does it stop? I forget. Counting? I forget what the line was specifically. He says something like, um, "It the only profound. thing that really matters is whether you can sleep at night." Yeah. Yeah, something and like then, that. like that's your setup, and Mando gets to sit there and fume. And then he ends up breaking his rule. And then to nail it home, we get to see the sequence of events that led uh, Mayfield's character to reach that discussion. Where he's forced to confront, like, what rules does he have to bend or break for himself? Which in this particular case is, like, basic self-preservation. Well, like, can you possibly walk out of the room and just leave this guy alone? This guy's the scum of the earth. Yeah. Well, to be fair, I mean, technically, no living person did see him that day. You know, at the end, no, at the end of the totally episode, look over him. No. Yeah, but and... but do they live? Ha! <laughs> oh, no, that's the loophole. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. They all do, it does. Do well, they live? Whenever you. Whenever both of you were watching this, Paige was very insistent on the idea that, oh, he's going to have to die now. He saw his face, so he must be murdered. Well, it's well, it's that and the fact that it's Bill Burr, and I go by SVU rules, where if someone mm-hmm. very famous is there, they either have to die or they are the right. villain. So I, so I was pleasantly surprised with what they did at the end. But it still makes sense, and it's perfect and beautiful and mwah. Something Good. that, um, also that... Like, that's a really important episode. Uh, something that always yeah. always impressed me with that episode, and also way back uh, in, during his face reveal in uh, season one. Mm-hmm. Anytime that the helmet comes off, you can see, like, how terrified the character is. He's just like, a you, guy, you know? Yeah, he's, not only that, he's like, he almost seems more like a kid. Like, he barely yeah. knows what's going on around him most of the time. He, yeah, in a- so, he doesn't look like a stud, a badass action hero. No. He doesn't he look like Han like, Solo. He looks like a guy that he looks like a scrawny plumber yeah. that you gave a gun. When so I I didn't know what Pedro Pascal looked like. So in uh, episode eight of season one, when uh, IG Eleven takes off his helmet to give him medical attention, I I remember going, "Oh my god, it's it's just a kid." Like I felt like they purposefully made him look just kind of just sweaty and shitty and and just like scared. And I thought that was really beautiful because I expected, I, again, I didn't know what the actor looked like at the time. I expected, um, you know, Han Solo under there, you know, Ch- Chadley mm-hmm. Chadwick, you know, under there with the, with a huge jaw, you know. Um, and, and he was just, you know, and he is, a, he is an attractive man, but like they made him look like just a scared kid. You're right, Pat. He was scared. Like, I think the weirdest part is that like he looks like J.J. Abrams and George Lucas's baby. 
<laughs> oh really? <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna give you a photo here. Yeah, send me. Oh, there he is. Like, but like you see it. Like he looks yeah. like a like a, a little baby. His eyes. But also, yeah. I found this great photo of him just standing around in a bunch of weird '80s shit, and he looks like yeah. such a schmuck. And I'm like, yeah. He's wearing like fucking Hawaiian shirt and like brown pants at some award thing, and he oh looks my God. like some fucking goober who walked in off the street and he snuck looks like in. A nerd. He's cute. What a dweeb. But whenever in the episode, whenever. Uh, the entire thing's going on with Mayfield. Like Mayfield is the one that's completely in control, even though he's he's also terrified of walking in front of that uh, ex commanding officer of his because mm-hmm. he didn't want to yeah. be recognized. Um, and whenever Din has his helmet off, he completely loses all of his composure. Like all yeah. his badassery that he usually has with his armor on goes out the window, and he just he can't talk. He doesn't know what to do. He's kind of just shuffling in place, like the yeah. actual character uh, acting, like the just the physical acting of the yeah, like a different his, his, whole, his really posture strong. just shrinks and in, in on itself. Yeah, it was really impressive. Like I, I, you know, well, he lost his metaphorical and physical armor. You know, I think that was really, really well done. It was like looking at a completely different person. It also makes sense. It's like, this is a person who ostensibly got taken in by this, like, fanatical order as, like, a child. Like, how long has that helmet been on his head? He probably felt like his dick was out, you know what I mean? Just totally naked. They've also been hammering this into his head his entire life, this idea that this armor is your life, and this is who you are. Never uh, take it off. If you do, then you lose who you are. So Mm -hmm. whenever he's actually just walking around, being exposed completely, I imagine that probably makes him feel like he's at his weakest and like uh in terms of who his character is the person he thinks that he is he's he's probably questioning who uh he even actually is at that point Mm -hmm. which makes me wonder what season three will actually be about because if the first season was about revealing his past and him actually confronting uh like you know the the basics of how he understands what he's been raised to believe and realizing oh i don't even really understand what i believe it, and then season 2 is about him actually you know compromising that for the sake of uh his actual belief system season 3 seems like it would then be about him uh maybe forsaking it or trying to change it or maybe trying to reincorporate that into actual mandalorian society or something like i'm not sure yeah. where they're going to go with it well, especially, um, well, I mean, we already made a spoiler warning, but especially since he accidentally took the heiress's glory, what are they going to do with that? Isn't he technically yeah, the, right now the king of Mandalore or the Mandalore? They completely. Ian? Well, he, he can, <laughs> he has the right to rule, essentially. Right. Because he has the dark saber. Which, but he, wow, he can't I can't believe they use the fucking dark saber. He can't just yeah, give it to I her. Yeah, I saw though. that and I couldn't believe it. That's like a. That's like a stupid Star Wars thing. And I'm like, wow. <laughs> they could. That's, that's well, an evil lightsaber. I can't remember exactly what happens in Rebels, but it seems like because there's another character. She's this like artist Mandalorian that's part of the Rebels crew. I can't even remember what her name is offhand, but her entire thing is, uh, you know, her family and her family history. And she's the one that actually gets a hold of the saber. I forget how she gets a hold of it. She may have gotten it away from Maul. Um, but it seems like she actually did gift it to the uh, the uh, character in the, the um, Mandalorian. Yeah, I can't remember what her name is. But, um, yeah, I can't either. Pretty bad. She, I do recall her accepting it, so I don't really understand what her problem is now unless she's like, well, I that happened once. Maybe Don't worry about that timeline yeah. split. But either way, it ends up in the hands of a uh, Moff Gideon, who is great, in- and I, w- I wish we had more. We don't actually see how that happens, so I guess they could go into that as well. But I think, I think the logic of that is that after after we see order 66 go down one of the first things that happens is that the empire essentially genocides everyone on mandalore no or it happens after uh 
after the events of Rebels. Sorry. And uh, that's the part that we don't actually see. I don't know if it's in any of the books or anything. I'm not aware of it actually being shown in any capacity, but it's just something that we're told. And during the attack, that's how he gets a hold of the Darksaber. And even that, I don't think, is even mentioned in The Mandalorian. So that's more material that could be used for Season 3. What but yeah, uh, well, I'm curious what Jin... they'll do since Grogu, Grogu's gone. I mean, not it's, gone well, bad, but like just yeah. away. So I'm wondering what they'll do in that well, he was never well. really he was never really used as a character so much as a, a device. So a plot device, I guess yeah. It's, I guess it's more that they don't have that device to rely on to force the character to go where they need him to go anymore. Mm. So really, not much has changed, but now um, they just have to find a, a more direct imperative for him. And now that he has this dark saber, I imagine that's probably what it's going to be. Yeah. Although I can't possibly imagine that they'll just abandon uh, Grogu or anything. No. Like, there's no I... way that... There's no way. No, I bet he'll probably come in to save the day, last, like, super last and he'll minute. And be, he'll be wearing, like, a cooler coat. He'll be what slightly if he... taller. <gasps> what if he has a tiny little Mandalorian helmet on? <laughs> a little, like, ooh, so cute. <sighs> Somehow I doubt it. <laughs> Why don't you draw that Probably. instead of this? Draw that. Oh my god, draw, draw this that. drawing Eli. out. No, I'm oh, good. Oh, Patrick, that's a pretty what? drawing. It's fine. Uh, Although, I don't Anyways. see any cat girls. I gotta no. say, I'm thinking about the, the way the, the <laughs> season ended. And... I really appreciate it. Not not from a like, ooh, cool fan service thing, but that's nice, right? But it stands it almost feels like they depower the cast and remind you of like the continuing onwards in the future there will continue to be stakes because the Jedi characters kind of fuck a lot of shit up when you have to take them seriously. Mm -hmm. Like the the attack, uh, not attack of the clones. Um, they did a good job of showing that. That's for sure. Uh, in uh, in uh, what do you call it? Uh, the Phantom Menace. There's a part where you know they're about to get attacked by like a hundred robots, and all the normal characters go to freak out, and Qui Gon just goes, "Oh, it's, it's not going to be a problem." And they they just just ice like fifty robots, like yeah. it's, like it's no big deal, and it's like they do a really poor job of trying to create tension. <laughs> As a result. Like, that sucks. And we've spent, like, the, the two seasons now with the, our characters. And, like, I think the closest to death Mando came at any one time was he got beat up by a big cow. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, he got his fucking ass wrecked by a big cow with a big nose. He almost dies a lot, but that's probably the closest. <laughs> yeah. It's like I mean, that's really it wouldn't be as them. much fun if he just looked at it and it was like, ah laser ah he died. they do a really good job of uh, like setting the power scale I guess like making sure that you know how much of a threat certain things are like in that final uh, couple of ep episodes they have the uh, the dark troopers and they show them and they're like oh they can fly oh, whatever I guess they'll just like shoot a few of them because they've been disposing of every enemy for the most part, pretty rapidly. Um, but yeah. they do. They have that scene where they are all stored away and they're being allowed, they're trying to open the doors and he's desperately trying to stop them from coming through and just one manages to pop through and that thing beats the ever-loving fuck out of him. And almost nothing can stop it aside from uh, him like barely managing to wedge the strongest material he has into its face and just like physically pry it apart to the point where it just can't function anymore. And then you have like, what, like two dozen of them storming around the ship. And it really the makes it clear that, that, Oh, there's no way they can win. The only issue I have with that. And it's kind of, it's not fair, but it's reality. It's like, it's metatextual knowledge. I'm like, I'm watching it. I'm like, well, they're not going to kill the whole cast. Mm -hmm. But no. this is otherwise completely inescapable. So someone's going to have to come along and save them. So the your brain just start rapidly goes down the list of of possible outcomes. And it's actually a pretty short list. 
Oh yeah. Um. Lost my thought. Proceed. Oh. Hmm. Well, here's my question. Pat, what was your favorite episode and why? Let me go look at an episode list. Yes. <laughs> here, do, you, do you have... Here, I can send you my list here. I'll put it oh, in Something the... I, I also wanted to shout out while you're thinking about that. Sure. Um, bringing back the actor, actor that played Django Fett in Attack of the Clones. I fucking love that. Uh, Tamara Morrison, bringing him back to play Boba Fett makes perfect sense. Oh, yeah. And he did a pretty bang up job, I'll say. Uh, at first, yeah, I was kind of like uh, Boba mm -hmm. Fett. I don't really don't care. Like you don't need to bring that back for fan service. But they actually did a good job with him. Yeah, I I didn't hate it. And now he's he's gonna have his own series, isn't he? Yes, I don't know how long it'll run. Uh, what was it called? Hmm. I think it was called like the Boba Fett, Boba Fett. something. Yeah, something. The Book or of Boba Fett. Yeah, Book yeah, of Boba Fett. Book of Boba yeah. Fett. Yeah. 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 Uh, I think my favorite episode is uh, season two, episode five, the Jedi. That's the one where he meets Ahsoka. But yeah. it's not because he hangs out with Ahsoka. It's because I'm madly in love with the absolute annihilated shithole planet that that episode takes place on. Yeah, it's and awesome. Like the, the it has HK units in it, so yay. But also just the the the, the confrontation between it was this funny little thing where we're watching it and uh, the the I don't know what to call it the Countess or whatever is having a lightsaber fight with Ahsoka in the courtyard, mm -hmm. and it's like yeah whatever I'm much more interested in um, in uh, what's his name uh, James Bean no uh, Michael Bean. And Mando just kind of staring at each other, holding their guns yeah. Yeah. out in the street. Like, that was by far the more interesting confrontation. It was probably mm -hmm. my favorite thing in the whole show. Interesting. I would have I would have to say I liked, uh, in season one, it would be either Sanctuary, which is the, the Widow episode. Or, well, Prisoner was really good, too. That's the one um, with uh, Bill Burr. And uh, that whole crew. I think Redemption, though, wins for me in uh, uh, episode eight. The, the one where um, IG-11 sacrifices himself. Yeah. I just, ev everything about that episode just tied the whole season up. Um, I, I cried. I, I literally laughed. I cried. I hurled. Um, I, I love, like, IG-11's quote-unquote growth. I... Loved when IG-11 removes Mandalorian's helmet, and then you see you see him for the first time. Um, I just thought it was incredibly well done and I th very good. I think that while that's not my favorite, it's probably one of the best, and it mm -hmm. has my favorite—I don't know what to call this—Star Wars ism in it, mm -hmm. uh, which is the moment with the 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 stormtroopers trying to shoot something on the ground. Oh, yes. Yeah. They, oh, yeah, they yeah. have just like astonishingly poor aim. Like it's just laughable. Played by yeah. Adam Pally and Jason Sudeckis. Oh really? Oh yeah. yeah everybody wants to be on this. Uh, but yeah, uh, this kind of. <laughs> I don't think you guys were quite uh, ready for that bit, just because the episode prior to that was. Um, uh, one of your favorite characters being killed off mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. as he was desperately like that actually did surprise me because I thought yeah. surely he would like make it to the ship and then something else would happen and they would get hold of the child that way. Uh, I did not expect him to just die like uh, a few feet away from actually making it. Yeah. But then you have in the very next episode, it just begins with these two chuckle fucks trying to shoot a can or something on the ground. So funny. And just sitting there for like a good five minutes, just shooting the shit. It's what just would... the, it's this weird thing where Star Wars has been going on for so long, and like the there have been so many bullets fired at protagonists by this particular force that I don't know when it happened, but I felt like it had to be addressed at some point because it's yeah. like these, these these motherfuckers are like the worst. You remember it's, whenever it... in the very first film, Obi Wan <laughs> says only stormtroopers could be that accurate. Yeah, it's hilarious. It's like, what are you, what are you talking about, man? Which I guess, uh, from his day, it would make sense <laughs> if 
because during his day, they would have been clone troopers. So, of course, they would yeah. be insanely accurate. Yeah. But, of course, uh, by the time that they have replaced all of that with just enlistees that don't really want to be there and are just doing it for some money and they're not really well trained, then, yeah, it makes more sense why they would all be terrible at their jobs. Does Does a stormtrooper manage to shoot a main character ever? Uh, I don't like think so. ever, like even wound them. I don't think so. <laughs> like I can't remember even one instance. I mean, I definitely remember characters being shot, but I don't know if it's like. And there have been times, of course, and especially in the uh, like the CG uh, cartoons, where they've been in like wartime and they've been shot by a bunch of different characters and of course there was order 66 where all the jedi get gunned down by them by but those were clone troopers clone troopers but no i I can't think of any off the top of my head i'm sure that there's an example somewhere but they just exist to die they're just ensign rickies top to bottom sad i don't really have a favorite episode myself i guess i have more favorite moments like what hmm well, there's lots of favorite moments. We've been discussing them this whole time. That's uh, true. But I did like... Uh, there. I think it was two episodes, actually. It was the little miniature arc where he ru- he's looking for another Mandalorian on Tatooine. And he runs into uh, uh, Timothy Oliphant playing as uh, Cobb. Oh, and the he's sheriff? like the... Yeah, the sheriff or the marshal or whatever he's called. And he's wearing bits of Boba Fett's armor and he looks like a joke in them. Like he looks yeah. Oh, yeah. Like ill-fitted child is what he looks like. And the armor itself looks like trash. Yeah, he hasn't been and taking like, care of it. But I, like, I did like that sequence. Um, yeah. Especially for the payoff much later on. I forgot how much later it is, but whenever Boba Fett does come back, he reclaims the armor, and then you see him, and he looks great. Like, you can tell that he <laughs> has completely fixed the armor in every way. It mm-hmm. uh, He repainted it or something, and now he almost looks like a toy, just because of how uh, clean and almost plasticky the material looks. Yeah. And the first thing he does is fuck up, like, a, an entire like two platoons or something of uh, stormtroopers who just flee in terror and he manages to shoot down both their ships at the same time with that uh, lovely rocket on his back. And that was a lot of fun. <clears throat> I um really liked uh, uh, Boba Fett way more than I thought I would in in this series. Because Boba agree. Fett has always been a character that is like, uh, like he, he's always been the toy character in my head. Mm-hmm. of, I don't want to think about Boba Fett, I don't want to talk about Boba Fett, because there's nothing to his character. He's like Darth Maul, like how Darth, Darth yeah. Maul used to be. Looks a lot of people cool. always, would always say, like, oh, who's your favorite character? Oh, Darth Maul. Like, He's not a character, you fucking idiot. What are you <laughs> talking about? He's a cool toy. Yeah. But, of course, that got fixed with uh, the uh, CG cartoons, where he is definitely a character now, and he's way and more interesting than he has any right to be. It's this thing where it's like the... the, the Boba Fett in the original series is like it's like nothing. He's just he's just a cool toy. Yeah, he's just a guy. But the 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 helmet, specifically the helmet, yeah, it just was looks neat. So appealing that this is where all this came from. Like everything to do with Mandalorians, like it's all just built on decades of people going, "Wow, that helmet's the best." It's a pretty yeah, same cool with, helmet. Same with IG eighty eight too. Like there's just he ex- he looks cool, and that's it. That's really all there is to it. And a lot of Star Wars was built on that. I'd say that most of uh, successful properties are usually built on that idea. There's usually some sort of really surface level thing that people really like about either a design or a character where it reminds them of something about themselves or something they've seen before. And then as you go further and further into the the rabbit hole with them, there might be more depth there than uh, you would otherwise expect. Which I guess is the same thing's true of... uh, (laughs) People interacting, too, where you might think that they look pretty or something. And then the more that you get to know them, that you realize that you actually like their character. This is how humans work, I guess. Mm. So anytime that you're designing uh, a character, 
for you know whatever like if you're writing for the mandalorian i imagine there's something to think of is what is their initial appeal and what is it going to be their underlying appeal because there always needs to be something that hooks you into the character first to make you give a and shit about a how they're going to turn out yeah yeah i was happy they like were darth able to maul take... that's just their physical appearance i was just happy they were able to take a character like boba fett and not only flesh him out but like kind of like scrub the indignity of his movie death off yeah because like Which he gets it several so times. weak like in the he EU. gets like not really kicked into a pit while wearing a jetpack and it's like well he's dead it's like what it's, it's in the eu in the books it seems like he gets out of the pit and then he gets thrown right back inside of it and then later on Aww. he escapes again which is one of those things where, well, what would be a fitting way for him to get his comeuppance after we bring him back? Oh, he goes right back inside. Ha ha, good writing. But it's like, well, we no. want to keep using him. Okay, now, and then then it becomes stupid. It's anyway, too popular. Here's, here's my hastily uh, thrown together uh, picture. where I was. The general idea with this was that I was just trying to get something done in the time that I had. So, uh, I like very that he's hastily got the ball. Painted. Yeah, it's he beautiful. has the ball. It's like Grogu's there, but not really. Yeah. yeah. That's the general idea. Yeah. So, Grogu, I will be interested to see, like, with Grogu, Ahsoka said that she could not train him, uh, and she gave sort of the Jedi answer, which I kind of didn't like, of he has all this fear inside of him, blah, 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 which made yeah. it sound like she was just giving, like, a typical, like, that's the reason why the Jedi fell in the first place. Yeah. Um, this is not completely edited, by the way. Um, so well, it, it made like, it sound like she was repeating mistakes of the past but what she was actually getting at is that her like her character specifically she was not prepared to do any teaching because even she wasn't sure what she wanted to be because she's not yeah. a Jedi anymore no. she's essentially like a vagrant she doesn't yeah. really believe anything at this point point. and the other thing is like due to her close relationship with Anakin like her more than literally any other character ever got to see firsthand of like just how bad badly training somebody can go mm -hmm. like she doesn't want to create darth vader yoda by accident mm -hmm. because she probably feels like she can't trust anyone at this point especially not herself uh the payoff in by the way if you have not i know you two probably just have seen clips or whatever but the clone wars series definitely has some stinker episodes I think of that horrible one where this extremely tiny, like, five-inch tall man takes droids out on an adventure that lasts, like, five episodes or something crazy. Some what of the, the worst Star Wars about? content I've ever seen in my life. Mm. But most of the series is good, and Rebels starts out kind of, eh. I didn't really like mo most of Rebels, but then by the end it starts ramping up and actually does get good uh, once it gets out of the... Uh, Disney has their little... Whenever Disney first took over Star Wars, they were really concerned about uh, everything being sort of floofy and very kid-safe, which is why Rebels was what it was and why Clone Wars got cancelled very briefly. Mm. Uh, but once they got out of that phase and it became good again. Uh, but both of those series are very good. Uh, they've done a lot to sort of repair Star Wars in that time frame in the same way that uh, Timothy Zahn sort of repaired uh, Star Wars in the early 90s with his novels, the Thrawn novels specifically. So give those a whirl too. And of course, Mandalorian, obviously really good. So any closing thoughts from you two? Um, I loved Mandalorian. It takes its time, I think, with the jokes and the characters, but everything is just super tight, which I hadn't seen from Star Wars in so long. And I uh, I was delighted. So I, I want to thank you mess. both for forcing me to watch watch this show thank you both really i want to thank uh werner herzog for <laughs> throwing a fucking tantrum on set when they talked yeah. about using cg for you the cowards. babies uh because the fact that that was a real prop ended up being goddamn vital in a ton vital. of scenes absolutely vital also pays off hilariously anytime that it has to walk yeah. Oh yeah. Like, oh, that, <laughs> look, look. It's like oh. watching a salt shaker walk or something. Yeah. It's amazing. 
<laughs> it doesn't really bother you. That's one of the weird advantages to uh, old Star Wars is that even though you can tell it's just a prop, uh, if you see it in context enough as a character, then you don't care. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> I wish to see the baby. Season three, I want to see the baby. More. Show more baby. Show okay. yeah, more baby. I don't know when exactly season three is going to come out, but it'll probably be a while, considering that they're working on uh, uh, the Boba Fett series at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it seems like the Disney has detected that Mandalorian was successful, which has made some people very fearful of the future of the series, because... Anytime that a bigger parent company or whatever senses success in a smaller version, then it yeah. invariably results in whoever has their greedy, uncreative mitts the largest uh, ruining uh, it in some way. So uh, yeah. hopefully it they got to well. they got to recast uh, Dune as well. I'm, uh, yes. I'm curious to see who they'll. I forgot about that. I'm curious to see who they will choose. I hope I hope that if the actor they choose to play Dune, I hope that if they do look different that they make some kind of reference like oh do you change your change your look or like just like oh that would be great (laughs) yeah i'm not quite it would be funny if uh i think you made a joke about that at some point pat in the podcast i remember what it was about a character stumbling out of a oh it was about final fantasy 7 about a g or genesis uh stumbling out of the pod due to time shenanigans ah my face and my voice they're completely oh different. yeah no no ah. yeah soldier g is like oh no my, my actor face has been horribly maimed so that i don't have to be actor <laughs> yeah so maybe we'll see the back of her head in a few uh, scenes and then ah my face ah yeah. my voice i'll yeah. have to be I'm- a robot now or you know whatever <laughs> yeah I'll use a voice synthesizer, and my posture and general body shape will change slightly. She rolls out in a (laughs) Star Trek chair and can only communicate with beeps. I'd be okay with that. Hell yeah. (laughs) Okay. Uh, Thank you two for showing up to do this. Only took uh, several arm wrenches to pull it off. That's Pat's fault. You're quite welcome. It's everyone's fault. All right. Uh, Uh, It's mainly pages. Let's be real. Nuh-uh. Okay, well, back to work for me, taking care of other babies in my life who always require constant attention. I will also take care of babies and go back to work. We all have our own babies, don't we? Yes. I'm baby. Okay. Yes, yeah, you're that, baby, honey. Yes, I love you. Yes, that is, that is the subtext here. Yes. All right. <laughs> Thank you for uh, showing up to our video. <laughs> Goodbye, everyone. <laughs> Goodbye. Goodbye. Bye. It sucks.